Ah, it's time to chill out and get ready for a mediocre Q&A live stream. If you're old enough, grab yourself your favorite adult beverage. And if you're not, stick with apple juice. Put your feet up and relax. If you have any questions, feel free to ask them in the chat. And now let's cue up the intro music. I hope you guys are doing well. Hopefully, you guys are getting to enjoy a nice uh, holiday weekend. Uh, for those of you that are watching the United States, this is a holiday weekend for us. It's uh, Labor Day, actually, today. So it's the day that we kind of celebrate and honor the working guys, basically, or working people, I guess I should say. And now, uh, But anyways, um, so for me, I was actually on call this weekend, and uh, one of my technicians wanted some extra money, so he wanted to cover the call, which was uh, unexpected and really cool, actually. It was actually my anniversary um, on Friday, so it was really nice. Jill, uh, my wife Jill, uh, and I got to go out to dinner, um, which wasn't what we were planning on doing, so it was just kind of a nice turn of events. And then other than that, like it really just was a nice weekend. We went over to some friend's house on, uh, was it Sunday? And yeah, Sunday we were hanging out at some friend's house and just spent some time with our kids. It was just a really nice, relaxing weekend altogether. Uh, I'm super thankful. Today, my wife and I got up. We've been meaning to do this for a while now. And we went on an awesome bike ride. Um, I'm a little bit sore from it. It was about 15 miles uh, in each direction. So 30 miles round trip. And, uh, it was really nice. I really wanted to go further because it's a really long bike path that we have near us called the Pacific electric trail, I believe Pacific electric bike path or something like that. But, um, it's on an old train line that is no longer in existence. So they turned it into like a hiking and biking path. And, uh, we, like I said, I've never been to the end of it. So I really wanted to, to keep going. But as the temperature started climbing, when we started the bike ride, it was about 75 degrees, and when we finished it, it was 95, and it was supposed to get hotter, so I was just kind of like, yeah, I think we should call it, and uh, it's funny because I didn't feel bad, except for sitting on a bike seat hurts, but I didn't feel too bad um, for long periods of time, I should say, but uh, now though, oh man, my lower back's killing me, but, but like, you know, I feel good as far as like my legs and everything, but it was just a super nice time, uh, some cool uh, you know, quality time to spend with my wife, just going on a bike ride, just talking, you know, relaxing, and I guess I shouldn't say relaxing, but it's important that we try to do that stuff when we can. You know, I'm not perfect. I'm in by no means am I the best husband, um, the best dad or anything like that. But I try, you know, 
And when I get the opportunity, though, I like to try to, you know, do the fun stuff. Like my wife and I, we like things like that. We like riding our bikes, going out on paddle boards, doing that stuff. My kids aren't huge fans of that. You know, they will do it, but, you know, they're not the, the they, they didn't want to come this morning, basically, you know, so, but it's all good, you know, but it's nice to be able to spend some time. I think that in this trade, we can, we can get caught up in the idea. And it was really interesting um, because there was a Facebook post. Someone was asking a question about getting people into the trade and getting younger people into the trade. And, and it was a really cool discussion between a lot of guys going back and forth, just talking about the issues that we're having. And it's, um, it's so easy to get caught up, especially if you've been in the trade for a long time. It's so easy to get caught up in the mentality that we used to have in the trade where, you know, if you were a technician, you basically, in your mind, you knew that you put work first and your family second. And for the longest time, our trade operated that way. And it still kind of does. And it really needs to get away from that. And I have a, you know, that's like a small part of some of the things that are driving people away from this trade. And I think that in general, we need to work on that stuff. Now, as a business owner, right, I'm a contractor, I have employees, I can't just tomorrow change the way we do everything, you know, but it starts with a want, like I have in my head, like, hey, I want to do this, you know, and then we start slowly working it into the mix and start trying to change things. And I think that's a, a, a small step in the right direction in this industry is encouraging people to put family first and work second. Now, at the same time, there's a dilemma there. And that's what we got to figure out is how do you still operate a business when your employees are sometimes going to call in sick or say, no, they can't make it to an emergency call. So there's some things we got to figure out, but I really think that is a huge thing we need to work on in this trade. And, you know, I try as much as I can to spend time with the family. Um, but it gets hard. I mean, this has probably been one of the worst summers I've had in probably the last 10 years. It's been nuts. Just we're so busy and it's just complex, silly problems, all kind of stuck you know, moving from COVID COVID really like put a wrench in everything and caused a lot of dirty equipment. And you know, you guys all see it in the videos. It's just crazy. So, um, I see super chats coming in, uh, Pennsylvania AC productions. Thank you so very much for that super chat. That is much appreciated. I really, really, um, thankful for that. So, um, remember guys, if you guys have questions or things you want me to cover, uh, just put them in caps lock in the chat. It'll help me to see them. Keep posting them if I don't answer them. Don't be offended if I don't answer your question, okay? If I miss your question or something, send me an email to hvacrvideos at gmail.com, okay? And uh, yeah, we're going to go ahead and get on with it. Um, I've got some questions on my list of stuff to talk about, and then I want to get to the chat. Um, let me see what I'm missing in here. Hello to everybody that's in here. Thank you. It's it's so humbling to see people from other countries in here, too. It's such a trip, guys. The, the emails I get from you guys, all that, I, it's it's really neat. So thank you to everybody that watches. Thank you very much. Um, you know, and I, I've said this, and I said it last time too, I believe, but, you know, I, I never really had a plan to turn this into what it's turned into. It just started as making videos for my employees, and then it kind of evolved into something else. And here we are now, a couple years later, and uh, it's just very humbling. So thank you very much. All right. Um, so I wanted to kind of talk about something else too that I've I've addressed on Facebook recently too. You know, and I talked about this last week. We have a new federal compliance coming in that we have to comply with. That's I don't know, whatever, but um, federal rules I should say that we have to comply with with as far as equipment sizing and how the equipment is manufactured. Okay, um, they call it AWEF, A W E F, and that's uh, I have to look at it because it's such a silly acronym. Annual Walk-in Efficiency Factors. Okay, think about it like a SEER rating, kind of how they have on residential. It's kind of like that. It's the infancy of that. So right now, all that they're really doing is setting a few criteria that the manufacturers have to follow, and they're giving. Uh, you an AWEF score for the unit. But as far as I can tell at the moment that I've done my research, which was a couple months ago, there really was no criteria for what score you had to meet necessarily, but as far as the manufacturers, but you just had to follow these certain criteria and try to reduce the uh, um, energy operating costs basically of your equipment. Okay. So they're trying to reduce the amount of electrical consumption unnecessarily, you know, versus what the equipment's actually performing at. When they do that, so now this is a federal thing. This is going to go across the United States. 
the equipment is going to be sized differently because they have to meet certain criteria. Most manufacturers are going to start by floating the head pressure down. So they're going to lower the operating head pressure of the system. Now you ask, well, how can they do that when the operating pressures of the system are going to fluctuate based off of temperature? Okay. And that's a good point. Well, we have low ambient controls in the system, head pressure control valves, essentially. Okay. That maintain head pressure when it gets really cold. Okay. And then you have uh, condensers that are going to try to reject the, or, you know, uh, reject the heat from the refrigerant. Right. And what they're going to start doing is, is actually oversizing those condensers. They're going to become bigger and bigger. Okay. They're going to drop the operating head pressure during normal operations. Um, they're going to have, they started adding extra subcooling circuits. So the liquid line will come out, the liquid drain comes out the bottom of the condenser and normally it would go into the receiver. Well, then what they do is they'll run it through a, a filter dryer or something like that. Then they go back and uh, subcool it again. It's kind of a trip how they do that. Actually, I think the, anyways, but you guys get the point. So they're just really trying to make the units more and more efficient. So the reason why I'm bringing this up, they're also oversizing the evaporators and doing different stuff with those too, um, is when it comes to using those new condensing units, right? You run into a problem because your system let's just say you go out to a, a failed compressor and you talk the customer into a condensing unit replacement. So you're just going to change the condensing unit, but still use the same evaporator, same line set, maybe change the refrigerant over. Okay. Cause that's a lot of the new requirements going ac across the country too, where you have to get rid of certain refrigerants. But when you just swap out a condensing unit, that new condensing unit, if it's AWEF compliant, right? It's going to float the head pressure down and that can affect the operation of your existing expansion valve. Okay. If they're bringing that head pressure lower, um, the expansion valve may not be sized correctly anymore. So you need to be very cautious about that and understand that, you know, if you just try to go a new eight, uh, throw a new condensing unit on an existing system in a cold climate, this system might not work properly because they're bringing the head pressure down so low and your system's not necessarily designed to have the head pressure that low. Um, when you guys want to do this, I actually have Sporland's tech document here that I talked about last week. It's a uh, bulletin 500-10-AWEF and it goes through the new selection criteria that you want to do when you're sizing expansion valves for AWEF compliant equipment. So that's going to be really important for you guys that are on the Midwest and the East Coast come this winter. If you're swapping condensing units without changing or making sure that everything is sized appropriately downstairs, these new condensed units may not perform properly when it gets really cold outside. So that's just something to think about. We have a lot of new things coming out. You guys need to do your research. A great place is actually to go to Sporland's website. I'm sorry. Uh, well, Sporland's website's a great place too. Uh, Sporland.com. Um, and it's going to be a redirect to Parker Sporland, their parent company. Um, and let me post a link in here right now. And this is a link for Sporland's YouTube channel. They actually have some great videos actually on this AWEF uh, compliance and how to use this chart right here. Okay. So you guys definitely want to check that out and go subscribe to Spoiler's channel. Tell them I sent you. So, all right, let me see what else we got in here. Um, I'm going to cross that one off the list. Wanted to cover that. Cool. We're done with that. So I want to look at the chat and see what I'm missing. Hello to everybody. Thanks you guys for coming in here and being in here. It's really awesome. Um, what's up, Jason Johnson? How you doing, bud? Um, uh, yeah, uh, Scott saying the, the liquid line runs into a heat exchanger re, uh, to, wait, what are you talking about, Scott? I'm confused, bud. Are you talking about when I was explaining the, the extra subcooling circuit? I think I misspoke when I said, but what it actually does is it comes out of the condenser, goes into the receiver, comes out of the receiver, then goes back into the condenser um, just to get extra subcooling. And then it goes downstairs to the expansion valve. Um, I don't know if that's what you're talking about, Scott. I kind of didn't really get context on that thing. Uh, Pennsylvania AC Productions, dude, these super chats, man. Thank you. You're, you're amazing. You did this last week too. And, and good. You, you don't have to do that, but thank you very much, but I really appreciate it. Um, let's see. Kip Stevens is asking about my thoughts on blue on. I have nothing really to say about blue on, uh, good or bad. I haven't used their refrigerant. They have a really cool app. If you guys haven't used it, you should definitely check it out. Um, but I got nothing bad to say or good to say necessarily about blue on cause I've never used their refrigerants. So, or refrigerant at the moment, I guess I should say, um, let me see. 
looking through the chat, seeing what we're missing here. I already answered that one. How much do I think the rejected heat from a condenser affects global warming? Alaska's asking that one. Um, I don't know, man. I'm not smart enough. You know, I, I really am not smart enough to understand any of that stuff. So don't know, bud. Uh, the 98 DeVille, thank you very much for that super chat. You guys, good gosh. Thank you very much, everybody. It's it's very, very uh, humbling. So um, any apprenticeship programs right now? Matthew Perez. If you're asking about me, no, I'm currently hiring or training an apprentice right now. Um, but uh, no, I, I don't have anything going on right now, maybe in the future. Okay, so um, looking to see what I'm missing in here. Uh Kaden, do I watch Steve Lab? Occasionally, I do watch his videos. Yes, uh, watched his his uh, his video today. Apparently, he blew a tranny. So, um, let's see what else. You should try Blue On's TDX twenty replacement. Yeah, I just haven't had a use to try it yet. As far as refrigerants go, um, I'm not uh, I'm not really into doing alternative refrigerants on my refrigeration equipment. Uh, I'm currently right now. I mean, when when I'm forced to, of course, I'm going to. But I'm gonna as long as the customer's okay with it. I'm going to use the the original refrigerant as long as possible. So if I have R, I still have a lot of R22 equipment. I still sell R22 weekly. Um, I give my customers options, but usually the hoops that you have to jump through to convert most refrigerants over are pretty big, and uh, it's usually you know just easier just to leave what's in there and what it was designed with. So, um, but I'm, that's just my the way that I'm operating things. In no way am I saying. That's how everybody else should do it, okay? Um, this is an agreement between myself and my customers, and I'm not judging anybody for converting refrigerants or not or whatever. So um, let's see what else we got going on here. <sighs> how did I get into HVAC? Seth Joel is asking. Well, uh, I actually started working with my father when I was very young. Uh, shoot, junior high age. Started working with him, and then I went into high school. I stopped working with him, had a few other jobs. Uh, and then out of high school, I actually came full time to work for my dad. So I grew up uh, learning this from my father and then continued my education, going to trade schools and different things. And then um, just trying to better myself every single day. That's all I can do. And just try to share the little bit of knowledge that I have. So so um, as far as a new tech, when it comes to new technicians, because I had a question come in and basically the, 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 the question is, how long should a new tech uh, work at a company before he's filled. Well, I'm going to add some things to this question because I'm going to add a few other good topics to cover. So, so first off, when a new technician goes to a company, how long before he should be in a service van? That's one question. Okay. Um, how long, uh, before that new tech can be comfortable at what he's doing? Okay. Um, if he should ever be comfortable and that's a good point I want to make too. Okay. So how long before a service tech gets into his own van? That's really subjective depending on the technician and, uh, you know, it's, it really depends on how well they take to everything and what kind of drive they have. But I, I will say that six months is my, my absolute, uh, minimum as far as a technician. So a technician's at a minimum going to ride with me for six months. Uh, now if he's an advanced technician, we'll make some exceptions, but an apprentice is going to ride for me a minimum of six months before I even start getting him out on his own. Okay. Um, my apprenticeship process is very slow. Uh, I try to drag it out over about a year. Um, but the technician is not necessarily going to ride with me for an entire year. They're slowly going to be let out a little bit more at a time. Um, like for instance, uh, my technician that's working with me right now, um, I'm about to put him into the on-call rotation. Now he's not going to go out and do the service calls by himself. Uh, there might be one or two that I can walk him through, but, um, I'm going to slowly start doing that and then basically give him a head start, maybe 45 minutes or so, and then show up behind him. And we're going to work through the calls together, but I'm not saying that's how everybody has to do it. That's just how I roll with it. Okay. So how long before in a, a, a new technician should feel comfortable at his job. Okay. Uh, so he's been put into a service vehicle. How long before he doesn't have to ask for help anymore? Well, first off, the important thing to understand is, is that we all ask for help. Okay. I ask for help. I reach out to my friends. I call technical support. So there's no shame in asking for help. In fact, you're doing the customer a service um, and, and you're helping them by asking for help because if you're asking for help or you're confused, then that means you need someone to help you. Okay. So just keep that in mind that we, um, 
we're always going to be asking for help. Okay. But as far as fearing, feeling comfortable, that is going to take a long time. Um, it took me many, many years before I was confident. And I'm going to tell you something too. Most technicians are going to go through a phase. So they're going to start working. They're going to start getting good. If they're trained well, they're going to get good at what they do. They're going to get to a point in their career where they think their stuff doesn't stink. Okay. I am fixing every service call. I'm not getting callbacks, whatever, you know, all this stuff's happening. Okay. Depending on the type of company he works for, the type of company where I worked for, I wasn't sit, sent to the calls that I couldn't do. Okay. My boss would always send me to the calls or my dad would always send me to the calls that he was confident that I could handle. Therefore, I got really good at those calls and he slowly started increasing the calls and the complexity of them. But with that being said, I got on that pedestal and I thought my stuff didn't stink. And then my dad started putting me out there into more difficult calls, right? And then I'd get really complex calls. And I quickly realized that I got knocked all the way back down to the beginning. I lost my confidence again. It takes time, okay? And and you're going to get to that point and you're going to start getting more difficult calls and you're going to work your way up. Um, in, in a perfect world, if you're working for the type of company that I did, okay? That's how we did things. So it's going to take time. Just understand, remember that, you know, your basics, remember, remember your fundamentals and work from there. Okay. There's no shame in asking for help, but when you do call to ask some other technician for help or for technical support, remember something you need to impress them. Okay. You need to show to them that you know what you're doing and you're not just wasting their time calling them, asking how to fix things. Okay. So when you call them, give them all the information before they even ask you for it. Say, hey, look, here's what I ran into. Brr, all the things that you could possibly think they're going to ask you. Okay. Because when you're collecting all that information before you call them, typically you're writing down a lot of key critical things that you might even, when you write it out on paper, you're like, oh, I know what's wrong. Sometimes that happens. Okay. So understand the new guys that come in. It's going to take time. But don't be afraid to ask questions, okay? And uh, you'll get there. You'll get to that point. But it's gonna, it's honestly going to take a couple years before you're truly comfortable and confident in what you're doing, okay? So just hang in there. All right. Let me see. I already answered that one. I'm going to cross that one off the list. Um, let's talk about employees right now, okay? I kind of covered it a little bit. And we talked about the fact that our industry needs help and that we're we're struggling to find people. Okay. We've talked about it a few times in different videos. I've alluded to things. Okay. It's not just our, our HVAC industry. It's everywhere. I'm dealing with it in the restaurants. I'm seeing it. Like I'm literally guys walking into restaurants. Tell me in the chat, if this is happening to you too, I'll go to a restaurant. Uh, I'll show up at 12 o'clock in the afternoon thinking I'm going to be right in the middle of their lunch rush. And when I get to the restaurant, I have to ring the buzzer because all the doors are locked in the restaurant and you go on your side and you find out, Oh yeah, we're not opening today because I don't have enough cooks and all the cooks are calling off or two cooks got COVID or where, you know, whatever it's happening everywhere. We have a massive shortage of employees all around the place. Okay. It's, it's, it's really a struggle with everything that we're working on. And I feel for these restaurants. Okay. Um, I want to address the fact too, that I saw a lot of comments about my recent video where there was a dirty restaurant, whatever. Okay. Um, and someone asked me a question, why am I defending greedy corporations that only care about profits and da 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 Okay, it was a very, very political question. Understand that I'm defending these restaurants because these restaurants, first off, they support my family, okay? And I'm grateful to be able to work for them. But at the same time, um, I realize that those restaurants and those companies, they are there to make money, okay? But I'm here to make money too, um, that's how I feed my family and that's how I support my employees. Okay. So I don't get political in the way that we talk about things on this channel. Really. I don't get involved in, in the drama, but understand there's always two sides to things. And yes, companies are going to try to make money. I get it. Okay. But at the same time, you have to understand those companies are doing everything they can to stay afloat. Okay. So remember that these places are struggling right now. Okay. They will likely make it through it. Yes. Okay. And yes, there's a lot of places that didn't make it through it, much smaller restaurants and everything. But uh, you know, I tend to lean on the side of the restaurants for the most part, because I'm in the business to keep working for them and I want them to be successful and profitable. Okay. So anyways, hopefully going off on a tangent there on that one. 
Um, let's get into the chat and see if I'm missing anything in here. Um, let me see. Does that mean you should ask for more money, Seth Joel? If you're worth the money, you know. But don't don't be a greedy guy because you got to remember the businesses need to stay profitable too. But everybody should be getting paid their worth. I mean, for sure. So everybody deserves to make the money that they're worth. Uh, I firmly believe in that. Okay. So what is that worth? What's that number? That's a question for you. You know, you got to figure that out. Um, but I would remember something. I wouldn't suggest being greedy to companies. And I know you probably weren't, you were probably being sarcastic with your comment, but remember this guys, I wouldn't suggest being greedy and unappreciative and, um, you know, jerks to the companies just because taking advantage of the situation kind of stuff. And don't get me wrong. Of course, every employee deserves to make the money they need to make. Okay. But don't take advantage of the situation because it's not going to look well. Uh, you know, majority of the people out there, they're, they're, they're going through crazy times trying to find employees. So yes, they're going to do a lot to try to retain employees for sure. But, um, just don't take advantage of the situation. It doesn't help anybody really. Okay. It might help you in the short term, but it's not going to help you in the long run. Um, let's see what else. Uh, do I work on any R12 systems? Yeah, I still have, uh, whew. I just got rid of an R12 walk-in cooler about a year ago. Uh, it was, I did a zoom lock video on it actually. Um, and I believe, yeah, that equipment was still operating. Uh, zoom lock max, uh, the first zoom lock max install I did, that was an R12 equipment that I pulled out. Um, and it finally just died. So, uh, but yeah, I still have some R12 reaching coolers out there. I still have some, I think I might still have an R12 walk-in, I think. Uh, Ryan, thank you so very much for that super chat, man. I really appreciate that. And that, that's that's crazy that you're not even an HVAC, man. It's, it's very interesting to see the amount of feedback I get in the YouTube comments of people telling me that they are not in HVAC, but yet they watch these videos. It's very interesting. And I can't tell you how many in this. This is a... I never anticipated that this would happen. So I'm so grateful and thankful for this one. But I can tell you of at least four people that have emailed me that said they started watching my videos three years ago or something, you know, whatever it was. And uh, that got them interested in the trade that they never thought they would have been in. And now they're working in the trade. One guy emailed me today saying he does supermarket refrigeration. Like, that is so amazing. Again, never expected that to happen when I started posting these videos. So that is an awesome feeling for sure to know that, you know, three, four people have joined the trade because they watched my videos. I mean, that's, that's, that's awesome. So, all right, let's see what else we got going on in the chat. Any advice on dealing with difficult coworkers? Oh, that's an interesting one because yeah, you know, it, it can be hard when you work with someone that you do not get along with. Uh, many, many years ago, I had to work with someone that I didn't get along with and I let it go on for way too long. Um, and we should have just parted ways much sooner and maybe, um, we could have salvaged some things, but you know, I let something go way too far, let an employee stay way too long and it got really nasty. And it was just like, wow, you know, it went to a place it didn't have to. Um, but with dealing with those people, you need to be honest. Uh, you need to, if you're an employee that has to work with someone, you need to report that to management. Um, you know, it may seem whiny. So with that being said, you know, don't report stupid things that, you know, remember when there's a problem, you always look at yourself first. That's the way I do it. Always look at yourself first, reflect on you. Is it something that I'm doing? Okay, then no, whatever. Then, you know, it's not something you can change, right? So once you get past that point, then you need to report it to management and you need to let them know because if you let problems with other employees go on for too long, that might be a red flag in the very beginning and management might, you know, get rid of that person before they become toxic to the company or hazardous to the company. So, you know, little, there's little indications majority of the time with people before they go bad. And if people tend to recognize those little weird things happening, then maybe we could eliminate problems before they become catastrophic, you know? All right, let's see. Um, but, but yeah, so basically report the problems to management. That's that as much as, as fast as you can. I just wanted to make sure I covered that. Uh, Midwest tech. Thank you so much for that super chat. I really appreciate it. You said probably your favorite HVAC channel. You feel like you learned so much. Oh, thank you. I, it is awesome, bud. Thank you very much. That is much appreciated. So in my restaurant, in my recent video, there, there's a real big, nasty 
comment section about how nasty the restaurants are. Okay. And they're, they think the restaurants that I'm working in are absolutely disgusting. First off, I'm starting to wonder if I'm numb to it, right? Because in my head, I'm telling you guys that the stuff that I show in my videos is nothing compared to the stuff that I have stopped working for, because I've seen some crazy things out there and you would be surprised with what some of these really bad restaurants, which I'm telling you guys, I don't work in any of the really bad restaurants. Okay. But you would be surprised with what these restaurants can get away with when it comes to the health department. Okay. Because we have health inspections. It's a government agency here in the United States. They go through our restaurants on a regular basis. Um, they, they typically, I will say though, they're typically not random visits. Okay. They only do random visits if there's been health violations reported, then they'll do random visits to follow up on situations. But for the most part, our health department, every restaurant knows when they're going to come. Okay. And, uh, while I want my restaurants to be, you know, not have to have deal with hassles, if the health department just came in unexpectedly, whenever they wanted on a, that would actually put these restaurants on their toes and they would be on top of more stuff. Okay. So in my recent video, uh, I showed the reach-ins that were really dirty. I'm going to tell you guys that I still stand behind the restaurant on that one. There's really no way for them to clean those units out. If you ever see how some of these refrigerators come apart and how complex they are, it is absolutely ridiculous. So I think my restaurant's doing something incorrect by buying this equipment, but, um, yeah, it blows my mind because most of the stuff is so nearly impossible for the restaurants to clean. It's just a struggle. Um, and as far as, you know, well, why don't they teach the cooks properly how to do that stuff? Because there's too much liability in having your cooks deal with that kind of stuff. Um, they've tried it in all my restaurants where the cooks are responsible for cleaning at night. And what do they do? One of the most common repairs we have on units that should be under warranty, right? They should be under full manufacturer's warranty. But the most common failure to those units is water damage because the cooks are washing the floors incorrectly. Should they be hiring professional companies? Sure, but there's not enough professional companies out there to clean every single restaurant. Majority of the professional companies out there, they just hire minimum wage workers to come in and they'll do it at nighttime. And we still see the high failure rate on these units. It's sad. Okay. Of course, you know, you pay people more, maybe they'll do better and stuff, but you know, these restaurants are doing everything they can. Okay. And I shouldn't say everything there. These restaurants are trying very hard. Okay. There's certainly things they could do to improve it. Okay. But I will still stand behind them. Okay. I've seen some nasty stuff. And if you know, it's trust me, I'm not working in the nastiest of the nasty. So, um, I saw a couple super chats come through HVAC rookie, Scott. Thank you so much. I really, really appreciate it, man. Um, and Android man, uh, again, thanks for that super chat, man. Uh, your commercial laundry tech and you watch my videos because I troubleshoot with logic. That's really cool, bud. Um, it's very interesting too, because I never really thought about the way that I do things. And honestly, for the longest time, I, I, I still want to argue that a lot of people can think logically. Okay. I know some people don't, they, I feel like they don't choose to think logically, but, um, it's hard for me to think that, that the way that I troubleshoot things is special. I, it just seems, and, and maybe I'm ignorant to this, but it just seems like everybody, you know, can troubleshoot the way that I troubleshoot, or maybe everybody has the ability to, but they don't choose to use those tools. I don't know. That's an interesting, that's an interesting question. You know, I, I, but I don't see anything special. So anyways, it's very nice that you said that though. So thank you. Um, let me see what else we got in here. Pennsylvania AC Productions. This is awesome. No, man, you see you, your super chat, bud. That is amazing. You said that you're super chatting because I, you are my biggest fan. No, it, that, that is, it's cool, bud. Thank you very much, man. No, you can, yeah, trust me. You can super chat away. <laughs> no, but th that is very humbling, bud. I mean, uh, you don't necessarily have to do that though. Okay. Thank you. I really appreciate it, man. All right. Let's see what else. Um, Let's see, uh, Carlos Nin, you said you've been watching for over a year and you start on Friday classes to get your Florida HVACB license. Right on, bud. Congratulations. Uh, this trade is awesome, bud. So, um, could my hump, could my company handle large walk-ins like Costco? John Deere fan. No, I am not capable of working on parallel rack systems, which is what majority of 
Costco and Sam's Club and all the supermarkets and big department stores that now added grocery stores, they typically run off of parallel rack systems. Um, I have the slightest idea on how to work. Well, I actually have an idea on how to work on that stuff. I think I could probably break a few things and figure it out. Um, but uh, no, I am not qualified to work on large commercial refrigeration equipment. Just light commercial refrigeration is all I do. Um, let's see. Uh, thank you very much, Seth Joel. He said he loves my passion for HVACR. That's awesome, man. You, you, everybody, this is awesome, okay? So um, I already answered that question. I'm going to look at my list right now. Let me, okay, let me hit. Um, let me answer this one. I already answered that one. That's cool. Uh, someone had asked me a question when you're working in these restaurants, if it would be a smart idea for myself to carry a steam cleaner. Uh, to be able to steam clean the ice off of evaporators, the, the dirt and grease off of condensers and stuff. It's a cool idea. Honestly, I think it would be another gadget in my truck. I have a lot of gadgets that I don't necessarily use on a regular basis, and I'm running out of real estate in my truck and places to store them. So, um, but I, I would be interested in getting my hands on a steam cleaner thingy or whatever, because I've heard a lot of people praise them and say they're awesome. Uh, I am worried about water intrusion when you're using that kind of stuff on these microprocessor temperature controllers and things like that. So you'd want to be careful around that stuff. Um, but, uh, yeah, I've never used them though. So, um, let's see, uh, let's see. Dis yeah. And one of the things I also have on my list of things to talk about right here too, is the fact that a lot of these companies do not, these manufacturers that make this refrigeration equipment that we're working on. I, I feel like they do not have technicians in mind and the customer's best interests in mind, but to be fair to the manufacturers, when the customers demand lower price consistently, and we, the consumer do that everywhere, we gripe and we gripe because have you guys noticed something? You know, the company Amazon came out many years ago, right? They were selling, uh, uh, what is it, books? They were, yeah, they were just selling books or something like that. And then they worked their way into selling everything, right? And remember when Amazon Prime first came out though? They actually had the lowest prices everywhere. Their prices were the lowest of the lowest, right? They basically put mom and pop businesses out of business and, you know, big box retails kind of struggling because of it too. But if you, if you go and you look, what you'll notice is that Amazon's prices have gone up significantly higher. And oftentimes you can actually find things cheaper outside of Amazon now. Okay. So it's the game that they're playing. And when these manufacturers, when I'm getting back to the point I was trying to make the manufacturers, when they design this equipment, it's, it's the cheapest crap in the world. Okay. And there's no thought in mind for technicians that have to work on it. And that puts us in a bind because then when we have to work on it, we look like an idiot because we told them this thing's a bad design or whatever that is. Okay. But we're doing that. We're driving those prices down because we're demanding less, you know, cheaper, cheaper, cheaper all the time. And these manufacturers. So I, in a way I'm defending the manufacturer, but then I'm chastising them, right? I'm defending them because, you know, they're making what the consumer wants. They want cheaper. We're going to give it to them cheaper. Okay. So they don't build with quality at the same time you know, that's better for these manufacturers, but yeah, anyways, tangent as usual. Okay. Um, I kind of feel like as weird as it sounds, I wish that as HVAC technicians, there'd be a way it's not logical that this could ever really work, but I wish there's a way where technicians and companies can come together and stand strong and enforce some of these things. Like we don't want to have to deal with this stuff anymore, but that that's a whole nother issue right there. Um, let me see what I got going on in the chat right now. Uh, let's see. Uh, see, uh, Ernesto Tito Vlogs is talking to Bill, but he brought up AHR in Vegas. Uh, if you guys don't already know, we have a giant industry convention for HVACR. So all the manufacturers of all that equipment, heck, even the manufacturers that sell to the manufacturers, you'll have guys there that are making screws and bolts. And then you'll have giant companies, manufacturers, make an air conditioning refrigeration equipment. It's crazy. And they set up this giant showroom um, and uh, it travels all around the country. So this year, the AHR Expo is going to be in Las Vegas, Nevada. For us Southern California guys, for most of us, that's only a three, four hour drive. So uh, it's going to be a big event for the West Coast for sure. And we're going to have a lot of people coming from the East Coast and the Midwest too. 
Um, if you guys don't know about it, it's something you definitely want to check out is the AHR Expo. So it'll be the AHR 2022 Expo. And uh, I do plan on being there. I'm going to do everything I can to make it out there for sure. So it's going to be an awesome. And I'll be spending time at the Sporlin booth too. Um, let's see what else we got in here. What am I missing? Um, question, why not install open door alarms on walk-in doors like modern home fridges? Okay, so that is one of the most common questions I got with my video where I had a frustrating walk-in freezer call, I think was the title of it. So why don't I install alarms? Why don't I install switches that turn off the refrigeration equipment uh, when the doors open, different things like that. And it really comes down to the customer not wanting that stuff, okay? Um, now, as things get worse and worse, when these corporations are realizing that they're having employee problems, I kind of think they might start wanting to go that direction to having us install remote monitoring kind of stuff and door alarms and you know door switches and different things. But at the moment right now, the customers are not in that frame of mind. Um, there is stuff out there that you can do when customers will consistently leave doors open, um, you know, but uh, it's just really what the customer doesn't or does want, okay? And I found restaurants where they've approved me to go install door alarms and things, and I'll go back there like a month later, and the cooks just take duct tape and put it over the door alarms, and managers don't seem to notice, so it's like, well, then why did they have me put that door alarm in? They're just gonna cover it with duct tape, you know? Um, all right, so I had a question come in and uh, this is a long question, but I want to read this because there's some interesting points that he's making in here and I'm going to cover it. Okay. So um, this person emailed me and they said they work in a hotel that has water source heat pumps in every room and some have suction line dryers. They all have reversing valves. Uh, and he says he has the most unusual data that he's ever seen in that whenever the, the refrigerant leaves the suction line filter dryer and or the, uh, the, the reversing valve. He says that he's constantly seeing pressure drops, okay, to the point that he can feel the pressure drop coming out of the lines. And he's kind of curious about that, okay? So in your situation, you, those pressure drops are not good in a system, okay? There's really only two places in the system that you're going to see a pressure drop and it's supposed to be there, okay? And truly, that is in the compressor and that is in the expansion valve, okay? Those are the real two places where you're going to see a pressure drop, okay? Or a pressure rise, really, a significant one like that. Um, other ones, you're going to see a noticeable rise maybe in the condenser or the evaporator, but nothing like what you'd see in an expansion valve and a compressor or condensing unit. So if you have a huge pressure drop coming out of a filter dryer, and it's truly a filter dryer, uh, typically about three PSI is, is the range Four PSI is the range that I'm looking for. You always want to lean on the, the component manufacturers literature to find out what they recommend for the pressure drops. But if I see anything more than a three PSI pressure drop, um, on a filter dryer, suction or liquid, that dryer is restricted and it needs to be replaced. But a point that I want to make in this situation um, same thing goes with the reversing valve. There shouldn't be a pressure drop across the reversing valve. I question whether or not you're truly reading a pressure drop or if you're incorrect on your information. But if you do truly have a pressure drop across a reversing valve, that reversing valve's not working right. And, uh, it's going to be a, a big problem. Okay. So you want to address these issues. If you're seeing pressure drop, then that's going to affect your operation. And essentially pressure drop across a dryer is going to lead to a failed compressor is what it's going to lead to. Okay. Um, if it runs long enough, so you want to eliminate that problem before it becomes catastrophic for sure. Okay. So, um, so before in, in, in more context in your question was you were asking about what your superheat should be and how you can measure that superheat. You need to fix those pressure drop issues first and then address anything else after that but the pressure drop is not right so maybe a dryer is too small maybe it's size wrong who knows maybe the reversing valve is not correct i will say that you said you work in a hotel and i am going to say that a lot of times my experience no judgment to anybody hotels tend to hire people that don't have as much experience and or property management companies and things like that will have less experienced technicians doing things. So therefore, and I'm not saying you're less experienced or anything, but I'm saying therefore technicians before you might have done things incorrectly that can lead to these problems. So when we're addressing things in this industry, we need to remember that maybe someone else worked on it before us and maybe they didn't do their job right. So when we're changing components and things like that, you don't want to just assume that what's in there is right. Okay, you got to use your senses and kind of just look at things and go, that doesn't look like a factory dryer. 
but this thing's supposed to be brand new and I'm the third company on it and nobody could figure out what's wrong with it and everybody's changed parts. You know what I mean? It leads to those things. So always investigate your equipment to make sure the first person before you actually did their job right and didn't create a bigger problem for you to try to figure out. Uh, let's see what else. Um, what do we got in here? What am I missing? Uh, standard style. Thank you for becoming a channel member. Thank you very much. So, um, shameless, you know, whatever you want to say, uh, YouTube channel memberships is like Patreon. And if you don't know what Patreon is, I have one of those too. Patreon is a service where you basically say, Hey, I want to support this creator. And you agree to an amount of money that you support on a regular basis. Okay. So YouTube channel memberships, which is what standard style just did. Um, he essentially became a member and just, you know, whatever amount he decided he contributes that on a monthly level to help support the channel. Um, all right. Um, have I seen a terminal blowout happen in front of me? No, he's talking about a terminal blowing out from the compressor terminals in front of my face. No, I've seen videos on social media, but I've currently not seen that. Um, Chris Young, oh, dude, Chris Young, you know what? I've been waiting for you this whole time, bro. Thank you so very much at you, uh, your arrival. You are absolutely correct in your comment. No, I'm just messing with you, bro. All right. Um, my thoughts on more females entering the trade. Um, Rita Loy, thank you very much for becoming a channel supporter. That is awesome. Uh, I definitely think females in the trade are a good thing, but I do have one, one worry about it, okay? Being that the HVAC trade has been dominated by men for so very long, uh, there's a lot of, of tradition and different stuff that happens in the trade, and I want and need females to come help in this trade, but I worry that... Um, you know, it, it's going to be hard and there's going to be, you know, bad stuff that happens as far as harassment and things like that. So uh, while I fully want females and need females to come into the trade because we need the help, I just fear for them uh, for harassment and things like that. OK, um, and maybe that's just the father in me because I'm a father of two daughters and I'm very like, oh, man, I don't want them to be in the situation where they're not potentially subjected to something that they don't need to be around, you know. Um, but there's nothing wrong with having females. I think they can pull their weight. I think they can do everything that, that I can do in this trade for sure. Okay. Um, of course you might have, uh, you know, a female lady that can't lift as much weight as me, but you might also have another dude that can't lift as much weight as me. So, I mean, you know, it's all things that we're going to have to work with. And, uh, I think more females coming into the trade is an answer to our problem for sure. We need, and we need younger blood coming into the trade, but yeah, we need it for sure. Um, and think about it too. If you think about females in the trade, think about how many restaurants you go to, if you do work, restaurant work or, or businesses or retail environments that you go to where females are running the restaurants or the, the stores or whatever their managers, you know, or the person that the technician is going to interact with is a female. So I'm not saying that it should always be female to female interaction, but I'm saying that it, that's definitely going to help the trade and make some people feel more comfortable too, if that makes sense. I don't know. All right. Um, I did have a question or a, a viewer that was watching or commented on a YouTube video, right? And they had a really interesting comment. I'm not going to say what their name was or anything because I don't want to give them that attention. But the comment that they left was a negative comment. And it said they were referring to a video that I had worked on uh, where I worked on a walk-in freezer. It was a late night walk-in freezer call a couple weeks ago. And I went out there and I finished the call and it was a bad transformer. Okay. Okay. And uh, when I was working on the system, I said, you know what? The system seems like it's operating properly. It dropped in temperature. Um, it's got a clear sight glass. So I decided not to put my service gauges on that system. Okay. Now this person is commenting on that video and that decision that I made. And he's saying he hopes that I don't think I'm a tech if I don't use gauges. He's, and he says it sounds like I'm guessing because I didn't put service gauges on that system. So his question was kind of written a little in bad grammar or whatever anyways. But anyways, he's criticizing me for not putting my gauges on a system. Um, no, uh, you know, given the opportunity or given the, the, you don't want to have to put service gauges on everything, every single system out there. Okay. You, you should not immediately gauge up until you've checked a few other things. Uh, if I don't have to access a system, that's less potential contamination for that system. Every time one of us technicians 
access as a system. We either vent refrigerant into the atmosphere because of a de minimis loss, right? Or we add contaminants to the system of some sort because we didn't purge our gauges and we didn't follow these proper procedures, okay? So if we can minimize the amount of de minimis refrigerant being released into the atmosphere, that's a good thing, okay? If we can minimize the amount of times we potentially contaminate a customer system just because we wanted to see a number, um, we're gonna create problems, right? And if we can reduce that stuff, that's a better thing. Now, it's a fine line though, because I didn't put my gauges on that system. I took a chance. Because had I put gauges, yes, I would have confirmed everything else was working properly. But I used my senses. And I said, hey, this thing dropped significantly. I'm not seeing any funny, funny frost patterns. The expansion valve uh, refrigerant feed looked pretty good. The sight glass was clear. I used my senses and I thought of the system operation. And I said, you know what? This thing doesn't necessarily need me to put my service gauges on it. And I didn't. And it has now been three weeks or something like that or something. I don't know. It's been a couple weeks since that service call. Okay. Um, I'm not saying that that means that everything's fine, but there's times that we take that kind of, uh, educated guesses, I guess, you know, um, is what I was, what I'm trying to say. So yeah, but I'm going to try not to put my gauges on as many systems out there as possible. That's just how I'm going to continue to do my career. Uh, what did we see here? Have I worked on screw compressors? No, I've never worked on those before. So um, do my daughters want to go into the trade? No, I've asked them several times if they were interested in coming to work with me, even coming to work with me for the day. They want absolutely nothing to do with it. But I will say that one of my daughters is a very uh, science minded person. And whenever I can explain in, in you know, small detail the science behind this industry. She, she is intrigued. Um, you know, she stepped outside one day when I was, uh, I grabbed, a uh, my torch, I was doing some work out in my yard and I, I turned on my torch and I, I started brazing on a condenser that I had in my backyard. And my daughter was really interested. She says she was really interested in the process of the metal melting and, and the science behind that. Um, but I just don't think that she'll be in the trade. Uh, I'm not going to push my daughters in any direction that they don't want to go into. So, um, of course, I want my daughters to be highly educated and all that stuff. But, I mean, if they don't want to go that route, then I'm not going to push them into that. And, uh, you know, I don't want to push them into a trade that they don't want or away from it. You know, I'm going to let them make those decisions. Let's see. When I'm working on these reaching coolers, uh, in my reaching cooler video that I recently did right now, we had a water damage temperature controller and I commented that that's one of the most common failure rates on that particular piece of equipment. So a lot, I mean, probably hundred, at least a hundred comments on that video were, why didn't I come up with a solution to waterproof that temperature controller? So that way the problem could not ever happen again. Okay. Um, when this particular manufacturer first started selling this line of refrigeration equipment, I did a bunch of warranty work for them in the very beginning. And I saw some things right off the bat. I was like, one of their most common failure rate things is failed compressors. And I'm going to say it on here because I've, I've tried to tell them this stuff. I've called the manufacturer and everything, but they have these failed compressors on these units, okay? They have a Danfoss compressor on it that has steel tube terminals on it, right? And then it's copper coated. And what they do is the suction line comes down and then comes right back up. And there's a slight trap to the suction line before it goes into the compressor. And then they put insulation on that suction line. And that suction line then becomes a bigger trap. And all that condensation that happens on that refrigeration line, when the water drips off of it, it gets stuck in that insulation and in that little itty bitty trap. And it rots out the steel tube on the side of the compressor. So for years... I, I changed hundreds and hundreds of those compressors because the suction line was rotted out. Um, when that first started, I contacted the manufacturer and I said, you guys realize you have a massive flaw here and it's really easy to fix. And they continued to use that particular piece of uh, insulation and never changed the design for another two, three years. Just, con and I, okay, fine, I, I blew that one off. Then I tried to contact the manufacturer of the compressors. I contacted Dan Foss, and I told Dan Foss, a rep, dude, are you guys seeing failures? We see this all the time. They did nothing about it. So 
I don't, I don't try with these manufacturers. Okay. Um, not anymore. I've tried and I'm not going to keep trying to fix their problems. Now, as far as my customer goes and you know, what if I try to sell my customer on moving temperature controllers and waterproofing them and things like that, it just becomes a hassle for me. Um, you know, occasionally I'll do it. I've done it before. Uh, and then, you know, it just doesn't really, it doesn't work out too well because then I have employees that I have to explain like these particular pieces of equipment were customized. They don't work like normal. I just really try to deviate away from changing particularly stupid, even manufactured equipment. Um, I just leave it be. It's not my thing. I'm just there. I'll report it to the customer. This is a bad design and that's pretty much it. Okay. I'm not really going to try to reinvent the wheel. Uh, cause then if I try to expect my employees to do those same things, it can get crazy and there can be problems with everything. So, all right. Um, let's see what else is going on in the chat right now. Um, what is my refrigeration company's name? Um, I really don't want to share that in the public form. I will say that I know a lot of you do know what the name of my service company is because there's, I've said it many times and stuff, but I really try not to publicize that information too much on a public form. Um, Kaden, if you want to send me an email to HVACRvideos at gmail.com, we can probably talk a little bit more in a private email. Okay. All right. Let's see what else we got going on in here. I see my buddy Bill's in here. What's up, Bill? Um, have I ever considered building my own reaching coolers and freezers and selling them? Randy Williamson. Yes, actually we have. My dad and I have talked about this many times. And if you don't, if you've watched any of my videos, I think I did one a couple months back where I went to a custom stainless steel shop. I have a custom stainless steel shop that I work with that is a equipment manufacturer. They make equipment all the time and uh, I'll go in and work in there and I'll, you know, they'll build a piece of equipment and I'll put the refrigeration equipment in it and stuff. So we've kind of gone back and forth many times talking about the idea of coming up with our own refrigerators, you know, and try to build something that's, you know, just amazing as far as quality and all that stuff. But the thing is, is that most of these customers, these, these people, these restaurants, they don't want to spend the kind of money that it would cost them to buy this equipment. You know, when, when these giant manufacturers like Delfield and Hoshizaki and different things like that, when they come up with a price point for a refrigerator, they're not instantly profitable, okay? They build in a time and investment that they put into that particular piece of equipment. That way, um, you know, eventually they'll make their money, okay? For me, as a, a, a person that just decided to want to make a refrigerator, that wouldn't be practical because I would have to charge the amount of money I put into this particular piece of equipment right off the bat because there'd be hundred thousand dollars in R and D and manufacturing at a minimum, probably into that one refrigerator. Nobody would want to buy that, you know? So that's a significant investment that just seems like a headache. Then on top of that, I mean, let's talk practically here. I'm not an equipment manufacturer. Okay. But an equipment manufacturer will not these days survive just off of equipment replacement. It just doesn't happen. They have to make money on parts too. So if there's a flaw, and um, I'm not saying this happens, but I think this, if there's a flaw in the particular piece of equipment, what if that flaw is just an investment too, right? Because if it's flawed, then under warranty, the customer, the manufacturer is going to have to pay warranty people to consistently fix it, right? But what if that flaw is a, um, an investment strategy too, you know? They know that in the long run, that particular piece of equipment is going to have a lot of repairs once it's out of warranty, then they're going to be profitable that way too if you're buying the OEM parts, right? So we're just like going conspiracy theory on this show today, aren't we? Um, anyways, yeah, off topic on that one. Um, let me see. How do inverter compressors work? Uh, Joshua Timmons, I'm actually not the person that you should probably lean on to hear about how inverter compressors work because I honestly don't know, okay? There's a couple really interesting YouTube channels out there. Um, engineering Mindset is one of them. And then Practical Engineering is another one. But one of those two channels has a breakdown, I'm pretty sure, on how inverter compressors work. They do an amazing job of analyzing and breaking down equipment. I'm pretty sure it's one of those two channels has it. So go check it out. Just just Google, ask YouTube, how, to, how do inverter compressors work and just wait and see. Um, Midwest. Oh, I saw that one right now. Uh, Pennsylvania AC productions. That is amazing, bud. Thank you so much for that super chat. Um, what do I think about Copeland reciprocating compressors? Also, you got a new tornado siren. Oh, that's crazy, man. Um, 
So as far as reciprocating compressors, I mean, reciprocating compressors are great. They worked for many years and we used them for many years. We still use them, but the scroll technology is more efficient in a perfect world. And uh, the, the money savings on a scroll compressor is actually better too in the long run. So um, of course, as we evolve, we're gonna come out with better stuff and things are slowly gonna get phased out and become obsolete. It'll be a very long time before a reciprocating compressor ever becomes obsolete, but scroll compressors have taken dominance in the industry. Uh, they're, they're innovating scroll compressors like crazy. What did I just read an article that um, Copeland just released a new line of scroll compressors that are gonna work solely off of R290 systems and they're larger and larger in capacity, which is a precursor to us upping the charge limitations on R290. Um, but uh, Copeland has a new compressor that is a, a scroll. I've never seen one in the field, but it looks like a giant pancake and it's a, it's a flat scroll. It lays on its side. It's a trip what it looks like, um, but it's a sideways scroll compressor. Actually, it doesn't look like a pancake. That's a different compressor, but the sideways scroll compressor is pretty neat. They can put it in a tiny little place. So the, the ability to evolve is high with scroll compressors. So reciprocating are slowly becoming less and less popular for sure. Um, let's see what else we got going on in this chat right now. Um, have I ever seen a compressor blow a terminal off? You had one happen on Friday, black oil everywhere. I've come into one after it happened. I've never seen it happen. So I've never seen a terminal blow in front of my face, but I have opened up compressors to find black oil. All, I mean, open up ACs to find black oil shot all inside the unit and stuff. I've seen that many times, just never seen it actually happen. Um, let me see what else I got in this list. Um, I already covered that one. Um, as far as that goes with the customers, you know, when it comes to these walk-in freezers, my recent video where I had a walk-in freezer that kept, they kept leaving the door open, right? Um, why aren't these customers installing strip curtains in every one of their walk-ins? Okay. Why don't they have strip curtains on every single freezer? Um, what the restaurants, a lot of my restaurants used to let me sell them strip curtains all the time. Okay. And what they realized was in the long run, they don't really save them any more money as far as energy savings and stuff, or, or the, the initial expense of strip curtains is just too much. Okay. I guess in a way they would save them money in the long run, but um, they basically rip them off, they tear them, they break them as much as possible. Most of the employees, when they walk inside the box, the strip curtains are annoying. So they just fold them and like put them up on the shelf and put boxes on them and stuff. And then the customer, it's just a nightmare. So they just did away with most restaurants doing strip curtains um, simply because of the cost. It was just too much for them. So my customers don't want them. I can't make them take something, you know. Um, let's see. All right, cool. We're good with that. Let me get to my chat right now and see what I'm missing in the chat. Uh, let's see. If you guys haven't already smashed the thumbs up button, it definitely helps out the stream. You guys would be awesome if you did that. Can a bad compressor can a bad compressor cause high discharge pressure? I mean, I'm never going to say never, but that wouldn't be a common failure, okay, for a compressor to have high discharge pressure. Because if you think about it, um, the suction pressure and the discharge pressure are relative. They, they basically, if one changes, the other one changes because they're dependent on each other. In a reciprocating compressor, you're, you're, you're dealing with a piston forcing, you know, refrigerant in that is essence, right, up. And, but it has to come from somewhere. So for there to be a compressor that is bad because it has high discharge pressure, that's an odd failure, okay? Now, to have a compressor that failed because someone, I mean, that's why I'm saying, I'm not gonna say never are you gonna see that, but to have that failure, that seems like an odd failure, okay? Typically, if there was a valve failure, which is a high, a weak point in a compressor is the valve system, right? The reeds or whatever. If one of those failed on the suction side, you would typically have a, a lower than normal head pressure, okay? So um, to see a compressor fail in a high head pressure state is a very odd failure, I would imagine, okay? And I would imagine it's probably because someone pinched a discharge line or there was some sort of restriction that was allowing the pressure to get up really high, then it killed the compressor. Um, but I don't think you're gonna see a compressor that fails simply because of that. Um, have I watched a compressor go bad? No, I have not. Have I heard tornado sirens? No, I have not heard tornado sirens, but I am, um, 
infatuated with tornadoes. Uh, they're a very interesting and very, um, they're, I know they're so destructive and most of the time they can be horrible, but there's a weird beauty to them in a weird way. I, I think it's just like the nature aspect of it. Um, and I've always been intrigued by tornadoes. Okay. But again, you know, no, I don't want anybody to be hurt or, you know, misplaced or whatever because of a tornado. No, definitely. That's a horrible thing. Um, let's see what else we have in here. What's with everyone wanting compressors to fail in such extravagant ways? I know. I don't know what it is either, but let's see. Uh, what kind of compressors do I fix? I typically work on, well, I will work on either reciprocating or scroll compressors. Um, let me see what else we got in here. Uh, what is the compressor rated for in voltage or the unit? Oh, he's asking someone else. Okay, gotcha. Um, let me see what I'm missing in the chat. Answered that question. Um, let's see. If you guys have any more questions, let's post them in the chat because I am out of topics. So I'll give you guys a few more minutes, see if anything else pops up in here. Um, let's see. What else we got going on here? What did I think about R32? R32 is just another refrigerant. It's a, um, uh, what do they call it? A A2L refrigerant, okay? So it's a mildly flammable refrigerant. So it'll be our first real introduction into R32 that's not mixed with anything else. But shh, don't tell anybody. We've all been working with R32 for many years now, okay? Because it's in another refrigerant that we use almost every single day. But don't tell everybody because we don't want to make them feel silly, all right? So, um, but R32 is not, it's just another refrigerant, guys. There's just some things you need to, to, follow when you're working with them, right? I work with R290 refrigerant. You need to respect it. And if you respect it and you follow the safety procedures, you're going to be just fine. Okay. All is going to be well. Um, would I recommend NAVAC? You know, a lot of people swear by the NAVAC vacuum pumps, recovery machines, um, swage tools. I've heard like a lot of good stuff about NAVAC. Okay. So I would encourage you to check their stuff out. I, I have no affiliation with them or anything, but I mean, there's some stuff that they make that is really nice. Uh, I'm a fan of the field piece vacuum pumps, right? Um, and a uh, little secret, again, don't tell anybody, Navac's parent company actually makes majority of the vacuum pumps for majority of the manufacturers, okay? So that's an interesting concept to think about, right? Navac, the, their parent company just decided to start the Navac brand as a venture. They've been a manufacturer for years and years, but they just got into the um, distributing their own products basically is what they just recently got into. So they've had a lot of years to perfect their equipment and a lot of people like them. So um, <clears throat> uh, not Kai had brought a point up in a email to me and uh, he wanted to know my opinion about this. Dave Johnson, holy moly, bud. Thank you so much for that super chat. That is amazing, Dave. You are an awesome bud man and i hope dave hope i don't know if it's going to be the case there's a very good possibility i'm going to be at the hvacr training symposium in 2022 uh at brian orr's at the kalos office so maybe i'll see you again there dave uh dave and i met at uh the the hvacr training symposium the first one so uh we did one last year and then they're doing a third one this year um so but hopefully you know if it works out dave we'll get to say hey to each other again but that was an awesome super chat man thank you holy crap bud thank you very much man that is amazing made my day and you did not have to do that dave but wow thanks bud you're the man um all right uh so robert b said robin air what yeah i think robin air might be uh, there's a lot of manufacturers that Na uh, navax parent company makes the vacuum pumps of um am i thankful that my father introduced me into this trade Yes, I absolutely love this trade. Um, but I will say, just, just to be fair, I've told my wife and I've told my family, if I could transplant myself into another career, okay, and it doesn't change anything about my life, if I, if I you know, didn't change my family, didn't change any of the important things about my life, but I just went a different career path, um, you guys are probably going to laugh. Some of you know what it would be, okay? Um, actually, I'm kind of curious if anybody will say it in the chat right now, what career path 
would I have gone in if I didn't go into HVAC? I want to see if the chat says it because I know there's some people in there that know it. But let's see if the chat knows what it is and then I'll tell you guys what it is. Okay, so come on chat. Let me know if any of you guys know what was my alternative career that I would have gone into because it's totally opposite from air conditioning and refrigeration. Let's see if this chat can catch up with this. Uh, nobody's catching up yet. Let me see what else we go. <laughs> you guys are funny. There you go. Laska said it. I would have been a park ranger. Um, I, if I could have another life and not change anything about my family, my kids, my wife, my, my everything, right? Um, and I could take myself out of HVAC, I would have been a park ranger, but not a park ranger in your local community park. We're talking a, a Yellowstone park ranger or, um, Yosemite park ranger, like out in the middle of it, right. With nobody, you know, that's, that would have, that's like a dream job of mine. So maybe even in retirement, I'll become a park ranger of all things. Maybe you guys can come say, Hey to me. Um, let's see what else. Yeah. A lot of people knew what it is. That's funny. <laughs> that's funny. Um, superhero. <laughs> um, let's see what Melvin asked, uh, what would cause a, uh, and I'll answer your question here in a ch second too, Chad. So Melvin asked, uh, what would cause a two month old compressor to burn out if you have proper voltage, assuming that there's no refrigerant, I mean, in, in no electrical issues and you have proper voltage going to that compressor. So we're, you're telling me right now it is not a re electrical issue. Um, what would cause a compressor to burn out? There's a few things, but the most common cause is going to be uh, liquid flood back. Okay. And what that's going to do is that's going to bring liquid refrigerant back to the compressor. It's going to wash the compressor oil out of the system. It's going to get all foamy. It's going to go out of the discharge line. It's going to exit the compressor and it's going to cause that compressor to have some sort of um, electrical issue inside and that's going to burn out the compressor. You're going to have bearing failure, different things like that. Some other causes of a burnt out compressor with no electrical issues would be moisture contamination in the system, which is going to lead to um, acids forming in the system and potential uh, repercussions of that copper plating on the compressor, which is going to cause premature motor failures, which could lead to a grounded compressor. So there's a couple different things, but if it's not an electrical issue, you're going to start with refrigerant flood back. That's going to be your issue, or you're going to go into compressor cooling issues and different things like that. But liquid flood back, in my opinion, would be the number one failure. Um, let's see what else we got in here. Uh, right on. Pennsylvania AC production says he fixed his own air conditioner. That's awesome, bud. All right. Let's see what's going on in here. Uh, Park rangers are superheroes for trees. That is right, Bill. Bill, my buddy, Curious HVAC guy, knows what it's about, man. He supports my park ranger initiative. Um, so, you know, maybe I'll go be a park ranger where Bill lives or something, and we could be buddies. I, I predict that when and if I ever meet Bill, that he's going to be like four feet shorter than me. And I'll be like, what the hell? There's going to be like some optical illusion, right? You guys ever watch Big Clive on YouTube? He's got an optical illusion when he's standing at his desk. If you ever notice, he's in a tiny room, like a tiny room. Clive's also a giant, but he's in a tiny room. But the way that he shoots with his camera and everything, it makes it look like it's a bigger room than it is. Um. So Bill and I, when we meet, it's just going to be like, what the heck? I just imagine he's going to be like four feet shorter than me. All right, let's see what else. DeWalt Drill or Milwaukee? I have them both in my van and I use them both regularly. The Milwaukee uh, M12 impact driver with, uh, yeah, the impact driver has become my number one. And that is my daily carry that I keep inside my tool bag. Uh, but then I have uh, a big boy, I call it my big boy drill. I have a, you know, DeWalt 18 volt, whatever giant hammer drill, whatever thing. Um, and I'll use that quite often too. So just depends. Um, Willie B the hillbilly. That's what will Billy the hillbilly. It, that's a hard name to say, bro. Thank you very much for that super chat. In five years in trucking, you will be making 70 to 100K. Is similar income possible in AC repairs in the same time frame? You're, make, you're 20 making 50K. Um, so, yeah, that, that is money you can make in a five-year time period. If you are a, a, a competent HVAC technician within five years, it, it is doable to be making over $100,000 a year. But you've got to keep in mind... Uh, that's going to change geographically, right? In California, um, a, 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 a badass service technician that's borderline supervisor, you know, service manager or something like that, 
you know, so he's doing more than just being a service tech, but he's also a badass service tech. That person will be making a hundred grand um, a year in the commercial side for sure, at a minimum, if not, you know, if not significantly more than that. Okay. So as a top of the line HVAC technician, yes, you can also be making over a hundred thousand dollars in Southern California, but you're going to work your butt off. But you, you know, when, when you're worth it, you'll make it, you get into the commercial side. I mean, so there's really good money to be made in HVAC and that money that you're going to be making is only going to be going up as the demand for technicians gets greater and greater. Um, you know, think about this, the restaurant industry, they are, it's not a question of they might, or they're thinking about, they are going to robotic kitchens. Okay. Fast food is really leaning hard on robotic kitchens. When they have robotic kitchens, who's going to fix the robots. Okay. I know that's a science fiction joke and stuff, but that's true. Us technicians. Okay. Those robots, they overheat. They need to be cooled. They either need to be in air conditioned environments or they need to have some sort of supplementary cooling built into the circuitry. Those robots are going to need technicians to fix that equipment. So we're not going away when the country and the world is automate or automating, right? We're still going to have to be the people that fix the robots. So HVAC is a thing, right? And I'm not saying there's going to be robots tomorrow. Okay. Slow down. Um, let's see what else. If I were a park ranger, would I get mad at you for slingshotting glow sticks across the park? Yes, in my park, that would be a, uh, let's just say you basically would be thrown off a cliff and not allowed, okay? So that's where we're going. Um, all right, guys, it is time for me to wrap this up. I really, really appreciate you guys making it to the stream. Uh, as usual, definitely check us out on the HVAC Overtime YouTube channel. Um, we go live Monday or uh, Friday evenings about 6 5 PM Pacific. Okay. And we usually hang out and stuff. Um, let me see if I can transition this over right here and right here. And I'm going to go ahead and queue up the outro music. And I really, really appreciate you guys making it in here. Okay. If I missed any of your guys' questions, feel free to send me an email to HVACR videos at gmail.com. You do know that I know that I'm on, right? And I still don't understand why you guys are still here. I mean, I just don't get the concept of you guys hanging out, waiting for me to do a silly encore or something. Come on. What the heck? Go home. Go to your home. There's still 209 people watching me dance like an idiot. Come on, guys. Get out of here. Bounce. Okay? Go somewhere else. Go eat dinner. Go do whatever you're going to do with your family. All right? Get out of here. All right? Come on. You guys got to go. It's time to go. All right. Just hit the stop button or whatever, man. Go to your home. Okay. Are you guys too good for your home? Just go to your home. Just, just tap it in. Okay. Just tap it in. Just tap, tap. -a -roo. Just tap it in. Okay. All right. We're going to end this stream. See ya.